Hello to all of our Pleasant Green parishioners and our other listeners. Uh, this is Minister Leonard Harris, and it is my pleasure to be with you once again uh, to discuss our lesson for May the 24th, 2020. This is lesson number 13 out of Unit 3 entitled, Called to God's Work of Justice. And this is out of our Faith Pathway Sunday School lesson. And uh, the title for this particular lesson is Do the Right Thing. Do the Right Thing. And our devotional reading is found in the 72nd number of Psalm. It is through verses 1 through 17. Our background scripture is the 22nd chapter of Jeremiah. And our printed passage is Jeremiah, the 22nd chapter, verses 1 through 10. And our key verse is, do not wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. And our lesson's aims are, understand that the covenant relationship between God and and God's people requires justice. Repent for injustice and seek to deliver the oppressed. Become active agents of deliverance for the oppressed. And this lesson is divided into two sections and our first section is, the choice is yours. And that would be verses 1 through 5. And then our second section is, a dire prediction. And of course, that would be verses 6 through 10. Well, once again... Uh, our lesson is loaded with uh, many gems, and our prayer is, is that the things that were meant for us to receive, that we will receive them, but then we will also act upon what we receive. Our uh, lesson is a call to action because it inquires of us to do the right thing. And when we look at the key verse, the emphasis is on the action that is detailed in the title of the lesson, because it instructs us, instructs us not to do wrong and to do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, nor to shed innocent blood in this place. Now, uh, the lesson, in short, is requiring us to be obedient to the precepts that have been set by God. And when we look again here, at the introduction to our lesson, uh, I just want to snatch a sentence or two from it. And I chose the part which somewhat expounds upon uh, the reward of obedience. And our lesson, the introduction, opens up with... Uh, uh, a scenario as parents uh, punishing or disciplining their children. And it says the reward for doing the right thing 
in my how in my home was the establishment of a trusting relationship between my parents and me. So there was a reward for doing the right thing in the individual's parents' home. And that reward was the establishment of their trust in the child. And so it reads on and it says, I was entrusted with more responsibility and received more privileges because of my choice to obey the standards set in my home. And as we get into the beginning part of our lesson titled, The Choice is Yours, we will see uh, a requirement or a incitement of that uh, these are the requirements or these are the expectations of God, and if they are followed, uh, these are the rewards. Now, as the introduction spoke, and it dispelled that, well, if we are obedient, if we prove ourselves to be disciplined, to perform the expectations and the requirements of our parents, then we were, we were rewarded with even greater challenges. We were entrusted with more responsibilities. Uh, we received a opportunity to express that we had even greater disciplines because of the challenges that were proposed to us. And by these opportunities being made available to us, not only did we recognize that we had the capabilities to perform them, but we also were blessed with the uh, experience of realizing that we had certain abilities within ourselves that when opportunities and challenges presented themselves, that we were able to accomplish those tasks. And because we were able to accomplish those tasks, then the observer, our parents and others, recognized that we had certain disciplines that enabled us to perform those tasks and maybe even greater tasks. And I, because there was a reward, then when there is a reward for something, there many times is the opposite of the reward. And therefore, we encounter the consequences of not following through on the entrustment that was granted to us. So I want to uh, read this from another perspective, uh, and then we'll, we'll delve right into the... Uh, choice is yours, and the choice is always ours. But in the 12th chapter of Luke, and uh, this was one of the uh, parables that was spoken uh, by Christ, and it was the testing of servants. And I want to read the conclusion of it, uh, but in the 12th chapter of Luke, and we're uh, starting at the 47th verse, it says, And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will 
shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. And when we look at the beginning of our lesson, uh, Jeremiah, uh, who I believe was serving in the 13th year of uh, the King Josiah, um, when we look uh, at what Jeremiah was saying uh, to the king of Judah, um, it, it somewhat uh, gives us insight into what God's expectations were. And so uh, I lift the part of Christ speaking of the servant because in our lesson, uh, it speaks of and uses the word thy servants. And even though a lot of times uh, we speak of kings and officials and rulers and such, in the eyes of God, they are God's creation and God's servants. And here we hear of Jeremiah referred to as the crying prophet or the weeping prophet because Jeremiah had so much passion uh, for his people and for uh, God. And so uh, many times he was overwhelmed at the wickedness that he saw and the holiness of the God that he served. And here in the beginning part of our lesson, uh, when we read, it says that uh, Zedekiah sent messages to Jeremiah, and in response, uh, God sent Jeremiah to him, <laughs> uh, to his officials and to the people in the palace. So he sent uh, Jeremiah was requesting a word, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Zedekiah was re requesting a word from Jeremiah, and God said, uh, I'm going to send Jeremiah with a message for you, and not just for you, but also for your officials, uh, your court, uh, your constituency, and all of you all, your entourage, all together. And these was the words or were the words that were sent. And uh, you see the first five verses, uh, and it talks about how the Lord sent Jeremiah and said, Go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, that sittest upon the throne of David, thou and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. And do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. For if you do this thing indeed, then shall there enter in by the gates of this house kings sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, and he and his servants, and his people. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, said the Lord, 
that the house shall become a desolation. So, again, uh, we are being addressed or entertained into the expectations of God upon the servants of God. Now, to, and I don't uh, take pleasure in using this term, but uh, sometimes masses of people are referred to as the commons or the peasants or just the common people. And then so much uh, honor uh, and uh, credence is given uh, to others who in the sight of God are no greater or no less than all of God's people and all of God's servants. But we place and set people on pedestals above the requirements that are given by God to all of God's creation. And so here, God is letting the king, the rulers, the officials, the people in the courts, uh, he's letting them know that unless you do as I have said, unless you follow my statutes, unless you follow my judgments, then all that you have will become ruins. And uh, a lot of times we look through certain publications and we see ruins. Ruins that now have become tourist sites. And as some of us have uh, been blessed to attend uh, certain sites uh, throughout the earth and uh, if we've uh, physically been able to see these things uh, with our own eyes and others who have seen them in publications, uh, we realize they talk about, and this area over here, uh, this is where the uh, rulers, this was their court. And this is where the officials would assemble themselves. And over here is where the, the assembly, this was like the uh, council. And this is where many debates. And, and, and back over here is the chamber. Uh, this is where some of the uh, higher officials would gather and then make a decisions over. And through this corridor on this end over here. And so what God was saying to Judah, to the king of Judah, through the voice piece of Jeremiah, is, is that if you do as I say, you will be blessed. But if you rebel against what I've said, because you become full of yourself, if you now all of a sudden think that you are greater than I, who have blessed you with the greatness that you presently are experiencing, then I will bring you to desolation. And so I want uh, to bring uh, something up here because many times uh, a lot of the focus is always on what we call the punishment of God. And uh, so uh, we always emphasize uh, why certain things are happening to us. And uh, how could a loving and a kind and forgiving God do these things to me or do these things to us or do these things to those people? How could this be? And I, I want to lift uh, just a couple of things. Um, uh, one in particular uh, is out of... 
Uh, and this I, I offer, um, I offer this here in your spare time uh, of reading. But uh, we are many of us uh, that uh, read uh, through the Bible are familiar with the 29th through the 31st chapters of Deuteronomy uh, referred to as the blessings and the curse. Uh, blessings and curses. If you do this, you will be blessed, and if you do that, you will be cursed. And I wanted to also uh, focus upon uh, a very similar phrasing, uh, and that is out of the book of Levit Leviticus, uh, the third book of the Bible. And here it refers to the conditions of blessings and warnings of chastisement. Condition of blessings and warnings of, just, of chastisement. And when we read through there, uh, the 26th chapter in your leisure, read it in its entirety, because many, it talks about rulers, and it speaks about how rulers are brought up to be brought down. They can stay up if they adhere to the will of God. But once they believe that they are up in and of themselves, then God lets them know, just as I allowed you to be lifted up, I can also bring you back down. And in our personal walk with God, it is many times uh, I would make this contrast, and it is that sometimes God brings us out so that God can bring us in. Sometimes we have to come out from among them so that God can bring us in. Sometimes God has to bring us out from certain things so that God can bring us in relationship with his will. So I wanted to lift that uh, from Leviticus, but then I also wanted to uh, bring this as well because it was speaking of uh, what our behavior and our interaction with uh, the fatherless and the strangers and the widows and such should be. And so in the 19th chapter of Leviticus, again, the third book of the Bible, uh, we read in the 15th verse, uh, and it says, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You won't be partial in judgment. It says, you shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. So there should be no distinction between our engagement to those that uh, seem to be unworthy or that we have, uh, we have somehow discorded or discounted as uh, not, uh, not worthy to expound uh, upon their issues or their concerns. So therefore, the, the scripture says, you shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. So here, God makes the distinction that simply because of the misfortunes that have come upon some, it does not warrant that I give more atten attention to the less fortunate but at the same time, it does not mean that I exclude them altogether and give all attention and recognition to those we consider to be mighty. It goes on to say, in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. The 16th verse says, you shall not go about as a tail barrier among your people. 
Don't go about always gossiping and dropping stories and lines and things that are untrue. It says among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke, rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Nor shall you take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, it's, it speaks about what our conduct and our engagement uh, should be one to another. And as I said earlier, that uh, sometimes we love uh, the relationship with God as long as everything is going in our favor. Uh, we love the recognition. Uh, we love the attention. We love the protection. We love the provisions. We love uh, just the nature of God, which is love, uh, actually directed towards us. We appreciate the benefits, but a lot of times we don't recognize the true benefits in God's rebuking or in God's chastening of us. And so we like only the good side of being in harmony and in walk and in relation with God. But a lot of times we don't like the checking of God. We don't like God to pull our coattail which always uh, gives us more rope than we're able to handle because we dangle ourselves out so far until then we look around and see that we are in uncharted waters and we have broken our relationship with the God who granted us these blessings. And so I wanted to just lift... Uh, from Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and uh, I will start at the fifth verse because we should also, just as much as we appreciate the blessings and the benefit of God, we should also appreciate the correction and the discipline of God. And here it says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as children, as sons and daughters of God. It says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, when you are corrected by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure the chastening, God deals with you as with children. For what child is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons or the children of God. So if someone really loves their children, then they correct their children because they know the consequences of disobedience. And as we so often say, 
Obedience is better than sacrifice. And so we wanted to look at the reward of being in the will of God and not just the, the focus of the good side. But um, sometimes we make the contrast between joy and pain. But we should look at when God visits us with correction, it is because we are loved of God. But if we can do whatever we choose and the spirit does not prick our hearts, then we know that we have displeased God so much that now it is though we have been, uh, we've become a orphan. Now uh, it is the absence of our parent. Now the last part of our lesson uh, is entitled The Dire Prediction. And uh, um, it begins at the sixth verse and on through the tenth. Uh, but I want to lift uh, just a couple of things from this. Uh, and I think I want to start uh, towards the end. And uh, in your spare time, uh, if you could read through all the verses and allow the spirit to give utterance. Uh, but here, uh, well, let's do the seventh verse. And it says, I will send destroyers against you. Now, at once I was your protection. I was your shield. But you alienated yourself against me. Now I will send destroyers against you. I will remove my protection and my shield and each man with his weapons and they will cut up your fine cedar beams and throw them into fire. They will have no respect for your dwelling place places, for your palaces, for the things that while you were in them, you were not honoring me, but honoring yourself. Well, now those establishments will be brought to ruins. Now, at the end of the verse, and it says, do not weep for the dead or mourn their loss. Rather, weep bitterly for him who is ex exiled, who is exiled, because he will never return nor see his native land again. Here, when we realize that now we are in a place where we're receiving the judgment of God and the consequence of our actions. And it talks about how, um, it, as we read through the commentary towards the end of the second section of our lesson, and uh, it speaks, uh, it says, uh, weep not for the dead, here, this is referring to Josiah. Instead of continuing to mourn his death because he witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah inst instructs the people and informs them to mourn for the son, Shalem, who had gone into captivity in Egypt because he would die there and never see his homeland again. So it says, although Josiah's death may have appeared premature, he was spared the agony of seeing his people, their city, and the temple destroyed by the Babylonians. You know, sometimes we um, focus a lot of attention on our loved ones and their departures. Uh, and uh, biblically speaking, there was a warning that was sent to the people to inform them that it was God's will that they would be restored. But because of disobedience, 
there were some that died premature or pre-adventure to the desolation that took place. And so here what Jeremiah was saying to them is uh, don't cr mourn about those who didn't see what you are going to witness but what you should be mourning is those that are actually going to be left. So it says the lost of humanity or lost humankind is more to be mourned for the fate awaiting the unrepentant than those who die in the Lord. Divine judgment is certain for all, the saved and the unsaved. All will stand before God and be righteously judged according to their deeds. So we should keep our emphasis and our focus in place and hear what the word of God is saying to us. We certainly hope that something was said or lifted that gave direction or insight to all of us and myself included uh, that would compel us by the Spirit of God that we would do those things that are pleasing in the sight of God. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.